site in Maine. We really enjoyed that site last year. Um, there wasn't as many ticks either, so that was really a plus, not to have to worry about that. Um, the curriculum outlined in your packet, um, it's pretty much the same program, even though it's just at a new site. Um, it's the same program that we're doing, with the same activities. Is there any questions? It's always been a trip that the seventh graders have fallen to. <laughs> I do love the leader going to an ocean, the ocean beach versus just, you know, the salt marsh, but it's, that's the big difference. And I know this the school committee says it too every year, I'm going to say it this year. I really appreciate the time that you and I think it's just the middle school team puts into showing the alignment with the curriculum frameworks and put a considerable amount of detail into this show every single standard that the seventh grade team for each subject did that. Um, they're, 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 really, they're really great to work with. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Next presentation. I'm passing the trick Yes. So I'm going to take you through just an overview of our accountability data and MCAS performance, and then you'll hear from the administrators about their plans for their buildings, plans or priorities for the buildings <laughs> or programs this year. Some of these data you received in the weekly email. There's a link for parents. And of course, the public can view all of the district and all of the school uh, data, including detailed data, at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's website. And once you get there, it's very easy to find school and district profiles. So the one important thing that's important, there are many things that are important to remember. One of those is that even the Secretary of Education stated that this is a new assessment and that it's based on a recently revised curriculum framework. So it will take time for results to stabilize. So we shouldn't be surprised by uneven results, cohorts <coughs> performing differently from one year to the next and getting different grade results. It will take time for things to st stabilize. Overall, the state in grades three through eight uh, uh, in ELA and in math performed overall pretty much similarly as they did last year, and that was the same for Hadley Public Schools with just over or roughly around 50% of students meeting or exceeding expectations in ELA and math in grades three through eight. So that's Hadley Elementary and the middle school Hopkins Academy. Uh, statewide, in grades three through eight, uh, all grades uh, showed a decline in students scoring meeting or exceeding, except in grade three. Um, in Hadley Public Schools, we saw that grades three, grade six, and grade seven showed an increase in the percentage of students in mathematics meeting or exceeding expectations. In ELA, Again, in ELA, the state saw all grades except for grade seven showing an increase in the percentage of students 
board meeting or exceeding expectations. In our district, we saw an increase in grades three, in grade six, and grade seven. Remember, you are comparing unlike cohorts, so you're just comparing grade level results from one year to the next. Uh, that's not indicating that a group of students declined in their performance on the same test. And then when we look at the percentage of students meeting or exceeding expectations by grade, uh, when we look at ELA, by and large, in many places, like in grades three and grades five, uh, by a large margin in grades six and in grades seven, you see that the students in grades three through eight in Hadley Public Schools, the percentage of students exceeding or meeting expectations was much greater than statewide. When you look at mathematics, our grade three results in mathematics for percentage of students exceeding or meeting expectations was much higher than the states. Um, we were lower in grade four, about the same in grade five, much higher in grade six. 75% of our sixth graders were meeting or exceeding expectations, and about the same in grade seven, and we were lower in grade eight in math. The state looks at average scaled scores by grades, and our average scaled scores in ELA exceeded the state in all grades except for in grade eight, uh, where we were about the same as the statewide average. And in mathematics, our average scaled scores in math exceeded the state in grades three and six. Uh, we were lower than the state average in grades four, five, seven, and eight. The middle grade mathematics is a concern statewide. It's not anything unique to us. In this region, I've talked to superintendents and across the state, performance in middle school mathematics is something that the state is looking at. As a matter of fact, there's a state kind of facilitated professional learning community in mathematics. Our teachers here at Hopkins Academy are participating in that. There are a number of uh, people are looking at all kinds of reasons that might contribute to some of the performance in mathematics. Um, and, and some of the issues are also similar to science. If you take a look at how we did in science, the percentage of students scoring advanced proficient in grade eight science in, at Hopkins Academy was 29% last year. Uh, statewide, it was only 35%. Typically, our eighth grade students do outperform the state, and you can see that in, the, in that line graph there, that H, Hopkins Academy eighth graders are the green line or the second line. And so for the most part, we often perform better than the state. And statewide, there's never been a, a banner years around 50% of students scoring advanced or proficient in eighth grade science. In our fifth grade science, 78% um, of our students scored advanced or proficient and statewide it was 73%. Since 2008, HES has outperformed the state in grade five science most of the year, so you see represented there. So I said that there's some, there some issues. We're certainly looking at the curriculum. Everybody across the state is asking the question about how can we improve performance in middle school mathematics. One thing, when I've looked at test items, either in science, I looked at a few test items with Ms. Duncan, uh, and also in mathematics with, by, happened to be at a meeting with a curriculum director from Hatfield. There are several questions that will say, so for example in science, what is the best answer? So there are two or three possible answers and you're selecting the best answer. Now personally I'll say I think that's a little much when you're looking to assess knowledge of middle school content in a high stakes exam, um, but those, those items were there. And Mr. Beck will talk in his plan about some of the <coughs> instructional adjustments that the middle school team is making. And it's not about teaching to the test, it's that we know that our students are very knowledgeable and we have other data to support their high levels of achievement. So we just want their experience with this test to, to match what their experience is typically. Um, the other thing that happens in mathematics, there are several items where they'll ask a question like, there are of the five options below, three apply, select all three. So if you selected two and not three, the entire answer is wrong. But there would still potentially be some knowledge of content. The other thing we'll look at this year, this is a small thing, but not a small thing. As Ms. Duncan pointed out, when the students are working on Chromebooks, which is what we use for online testing, 
many science questions and math questions have diagrams. You lose the diagram on the screen when you get to the question. And that can be pretty frustrating to have to. So they will practice drawing, but even that has a margin of error there to copy over a, a diagram. And we'll look at saying for some assessments, should we be looking at moving them to labs with larger screens? Because that would be pretty frustrating if I were taking an exam. Uh, your next graph shows you high school science. So our percentage of students for the last 11 years, Hopkins Academy in grades 9 through 12, it has uh, outperformed the state in high school science. In uh, 10 out of 11 years, by a pretty substantial margin. Our advanced and proficient grade 10 math, so the state this last year was 78%. Hopkins, 88% of the students were advanced or proficient. In ELA, we had 96, I think, percent of our students. 91% um, of our students were advanced or proficient um, in ELA in grade 10. And so for each one of the subjects in grade 10, 78% of students in high school at Hopkins Academy were advanced or proficient in science, 91% uh, uh, in ELA, and 88% in mathematics. Our accountability as a district. So in HES, your next slide is a screenshot of what you would find at the district and school profiles on the website. As you can see, it had the elementary. So the, the simplest way to explain the new accountability system is 50% means that you improved. So it's a, a four point scale, and they set a target for improvement. At four, you exceeded your target. At three, you met your target. Um, at two, you, so two at four, 50%, you improved and did not meet the target. Um, and at one, you stayed the same, and at zero, you declined. So, you can see that at HES for all students, which is the first set of numbers, that in English language arts, they exceeded their target. In math achievement and in science achievement, they met the target. Um, for the lowest performing cohort, which is a new part of the accountability system, the state determines the lowest performing cohort by looking at your October 1 data. The students have to be with you for two years. They have to have been tested in the previous year can't be a first year at ELL. They take all of the students, they take the bottom 25% or the bottom 20 students, depending on how large of a district you are. So you can see that for our lowest performing cohort, they exceeded targets in their ELA achievement and their mathematics achievement, which is fantastic. Um, growth, we met the target in ELA and we met the target in mathematics for both lowest performing cohort and for all students that had the elementary. Chronic absenteeism, that's if a student has 18 or more absences, it does not matter if they are excused. It does not matter if they're at the doctor. It's simply if they are not getting instructional services, then the state calls it absent. They don't care if it's excused. And so this one is a challenge. Statewide, we've been talking, superintendents have been talking about, well, how can we, how can we demonstrate to the state that, that, te that students may have access to curriculum or teachers or they may be doing work. We just had a child at Hopkins that was gone away with her family for um, several weeks, but absolutely kept up on all of her work. So uh, across the state, we're asking what we can do about this, because this will present a problem for us um, and for all schools. And, and so overall, 85% um, meeting, because you can see that they weight achievement, they weight growth differently. So 85% progress toward percentage of total possible points, and that's our criterion reference target performance. Again, at 50%, we've made some improvement. So just think of those breakdowns again, 100 exceeded, et cetera. So you've made uh, improvement. At Hopkins Academy, so let's start with the positive, and the positive is when you look over in the second set of columns, we see that, for the, so this is grade 10, this is high school. 
The first numbers are middle school, grades seven and eight. The other column is high school. So in ELA, exceeded our achievement target in math, we met it, and in science, at the high school level, exceeded the achievement target. Exceeded growth targets in English language arts and in math. So the five-year cohort for graduation rate, if that changes by, if that, if that changes, declines by a half of a percentage point, so I'm going to put you on the spot, Brian. Give me about 50 kids in grade nine, roughly. Current, like currently 40. So a half of one percentage point. If, there, if one student, and this includes students who might be on, on age outs to 22. So if you have a student who's in age outs to 22, your four-year graduation cohort, Hopkins Academy, Mr. Beck gets a zero in that. If there's, so that is one that you can expect to see we have a single age out, we have one student because we're so small. You can see though that students finish high school. The extended engagement rate means they finish. They just didn't finish in full years. So you can see, for example, for students who are on track to leave us at age 22. They finish, they complete, just not in a four-year period. And uh, the same thing with annual dropout rate because we were zero the year before, it, it changes by one percentage point that it's a zero for the next year. So again, you're talking potentially one student in a place as small as we are. We exceeded targets at Hopkins Academy for chronic absenteeism. Advanced co coursework are the courses the state has set qualify as advanced. AP is obvious, but in some cases honors, some math courses, even without an honors designation, qualify. But again, if that changes, so now let's say it's 100 kids, and if that changes by more than a percentage point, then you're going to get a zero the following year. So don't be surprised if from year to year there's a zero. There, it, it's a difference of one to maybe three kids. Um, and so in the middle school side of things, uh, we, that simply just means that we decline from the previous year. So the average scale score, or in the case of science achievement, the CPI, it declined from the previous year. That's what that zero means. It doesn't mean they didn't learn a thing. It means that um, that average scale score went down or the CPI went down. In their targets uh, at the middle school, they met their English language growth target. And their, as to their student growth percentile as a cohort remained the same in Mount the other indicators don't apply, and they met their target for chronic absenteeism. So the overall percentage for Hopkins, 51%, the high school is at 77%, it's weighted at 60% for the total classification, accountability classification for the school, the middle school being at 12%. And that is declines across the board are where you want to deal with that, but the declines were not, in some cases, all that significant. And the detail on the average scale scores can be found on that profile page. You can see that the actual a decline of any amount of half of a scale, 0.5 of a scale score uh, will get you this. So that is, by and large, the picture of accountability in the district. Uh, some things we're celebrating. So HES achieving 85% of progress toward meeting targets an overall classification of 85%, not requiring assistance or intervention. Uh, and again, we're very pleased with the performance of the lowest performing cohort. We'd like to think that the amount of years we've invested now in kind of that tiered intervention model is, is helping us out. At HA, overall 51%, but as you saw, the high school 77%, and so our focus is really on the middle school. And then district-wide, that means 45% progress toward meeting um, targets. I pay more attention to the schools and still have in the district they were in the respect of schools. And so we're happy about the aggregate performance of students at HES, the performance of the lowest performing cohort, and our high school achievement, which is fantastic. Our areas requiring, requiring attention are mathematics district-wide and science uh, in grade eight, and the special attention being paid at the middle school, and certainly Mr. Beck will speak to that. And the next steps are what you're going to hear about. Uh, 
although school and district report cards will be available to the public in December for sending out the Do you have any questions about the accountability system or about the data that was presented? So I'll send this one to you. You will. You will. From your experience, just thinking about what we've talked about regarding, um, you know, marketing, Hopkins trying to attract more students here, mm -hmm. or even keeping them between sixth and seventh grade. How much of the middle school achievement, you know, the zeros, how much did that come into play, if at all, in your conversations with families that are interested? And so, in my conversations, really search this. And in my conversations, really. Not at all, not in any conversations I've had. And I, and I can understand why that is. I think that, first of all, parents look at what happens in high school. Our, our middle school performance does not deviate drastically from performance statewide. So you're hard pressed to find a middle school where things are going exceedingly well in achievement and growth. So we don't deviate that much. When you then look at our high school results, and particularly things like where our students go to college, those who are interested in colleges, and going to college, and you look at our achievement, I think that's very impressive. And, and I think most parents I talk to are, are looking for an entire educational experience. So things that we'll really highlight on the recruitment website have to do with the experiences and the sense of community that's provided at, at all of our schools. And we have, data across the district that demonstrates that students are learning and that they're learning well. We have this, this one pocket of high stakes standardized testing in the middle school, but I, I, don't, I don't think it factors into decision making. No parent ever has to have that. In the week in the last uh, several years, we've talked about how much uh, pressure um, there was, there used to be at least, Teachers to teach to the test and how that really took away from actual learning in the classroom and uh, flexibility for the teachers to uh, uh, really experiment with their craft and um, uh, and I'm, I'm more so looking for those kinds of indicators using other metrics and uh, not just looking at zeros and ones. In each yeah. Other. Whether that defines. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, we have no intention of, of becoming a district that teaches to a test. We have no intention of making MCAS and accountability data uh, kind of our defining data set. All of us, all four of us on the administrative team, feel strongly that we certainly don't want to ignore it because, as Mr. Beck will say, he believes that. Hopkins is a wonderful school. It is a wonderful school. And our students achieve great things. And so we don't want a complete disconnect. We certainly don't want the story to become with accountability data that we are not a high performing district. So we won't let it define us, but we have no intention of ignoring that in its entirety. We're trying to figure out why is there this mismatch. But again, at middle school, we're not alone. It's across the state. I was talking to a superintendent who was named, unnamed, that said to me, I said, what is going on in middle school? And the superintendent said, trust me, I, would, I, I will swap out my grade blank, blank, and blank with you right now. I will. <laughs> because so we have a lot of pockets of, of high performance. And we'll just, we'll just pay attention and see what we can do to improve it. I do think one of the things that you described about less about test booking strategy and more about if there are different types of questions that mm -hmm. you may not have seen before where there are a lot of response options that are close but not the mm -hmm. best that you know orienting kids to that I think is helpful because sometimes they are you know, you know my son is black and white you know so the right answer should stick out and the other should clearly be wrong and when it's kind of a gray area like mm -hmm. that there's a best response but the others are plausible and close that it's a good um, kind of critical thinking strategy too to really think about all these yeah. options. I, yeah, I, 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 but I think that's a skill that translates well into other accelerated classes as well. And 
including AP. Absolutely, that's a common right. AP. Yeah. That's a common AP test taking strategy. Yeah. Select the best answer. There's always more than one right <coughs> answer. And so it is worthwhile. It's not about making them obsessed over MCAS. There are, there are good generalizable test taking skills and many of our students, because they are high achieving and have post-secondary plans, will encounter tests like this. And, and we really care about we don't want a student for whom we have all these data that demonstrate how much they're growing and how much they're learning, and then this one very high stakes piece of information comes home from the state, all kinds of letters. We just don't want that experience to be a mismatch. Right? I put up all this effort and I'm not meeting expectations. And so to the extent that we can look at the curriculum and instruction and provide simple tools, we can Brian will talk about some of the things that the math department is doing. It's really just about, we want the students to open that envelope and say, yep, I did that, and feel good about it. That's really where it comes from. I guess one of the things that I'm curious about is if it's a statewide thing where you're seeing these pockets of middle school students getting lower grades, um, at what point is it possible or is it advantageous for superintendents, school committees to maybe put some pressure on the state, maybe it's not the students in the curriculum, maybe it's the test. Yeah, I think that we, I think we're constantly in that discussion with them. We, so, because as you saw those statewide grade eight science, and it never got above 50%, so what's going on there? Um, and the state, Secretary Kaiser was very clear, like let's just, relax and see how things shape out. Science curriculum frameworks are recently adopted. They are fairly new. So let's give time for things to catch up. I think if we're still looking, and they also were very good this year with the new accountability system to not be draconian in their approach, even for those schools and districts that did very poorly. They were very hesitant. I don't think they put any new schools in kind of a level five situation. I think you could only exit five or four this year. So. They are trying to work with us, and we do bring it up, trust me. <laughs> to bring them. It's an excellent point. Okay. Steps. You already have it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Annie. Sure. Now we have the uh, EGS school strategy documents out. Great. I first just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to present here tonight. Um, I would also like to thank Dr. McKenzie, the staff, families, and most importantly, the students of Hadley Elementary School for helping make my transition over the past couple months seamless and successful. Everyone has been so welcoming. Um, I feel truly blessed to have the opportunity to be the new principal at Hadley Elementary School. As part of my transition to the school, and preparing for presenting this evening, um, my plan. I've spent time interviewing each and every staff member in the first couple weeks of school. I also was looking at the 2018 parent survey information provided to me by Dr. McKenzie um, and having conversations with my school council and analyzing school curriculum data. In doing so, all of that, I have created a strategy plan that you hold in front of you today. My strategic objective in A, instructional leadership, I would like to develop and continuously revise curriculum to ensure rigor, relevance, and alignment to state standards. In order to accomplish this, I'd like to create current curriculum maps for social studies and science. In looking at the 2018 parent survey, question three specifically asked parents and guardians what feedback was given about instructional practices. Results indicate that stronger communication and clarity about what our instructional practices include, what the curriculum we teach is at each level, will allow parents the tools to provide teachers that constructive feedback. I chose to start with science and social studies in interviewing the staff and looking at the work that's been done to support the new science kits that we've purchased along with the new social studies state frameworks it makes sense that we begin our work creating curriculum maps in those subjects across grades K through six. We support teachers in doing this important work by providing professional development time, grade level meeting time, and resources to support teachers in creating and strengthening these maps. 
We will accomplish this goal with the creation of detailed curriculum maps that align with the state standards. We will also have the opportunity to share these living documents with families to reinforce participation and understanding of the curriculum taught to students in social studies and science at HES. In ELA and math, we will also continue to analyze student data provided by FAST testing, MAP testing, and MCAS results in order to give teachers and families a clear sense of their students' learning strengths and challenges. For Section B, Management and Operations, my vision is to implement systems of support that meet the needs for all students. This process in which we, we will do this includes to increase PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention and Supports, initiatives across the grade levels. The PBIS team meets monthly to establish and support school-wide Hawks Wings program initiatives. We hope to gain an increase in student achievement by decreasing negative behavior trends across settings by doing this. We plan to also strengthen an effective learning environment by using steps to respect and second step curriculum embedded into morning meeting times and individual student conference times. This will help us continue to build a school climate and culture of respect and kindness, something that's very important to our whole school community. We will also plan to meet the academic needs of students by continuing our multi-tiered systems of support. MTSS, tiered reading instruction in grades one through five will help us support students who've been identified with targeted reading instruction in order to close gaps in individual student achievement. In math, identified students can also access support through our math coach, provide small group instruction for those students. For um, for Objective C, family and community engagement. I plan to increase family and community engagement by strengthening communication and participation around special events, school-wide information, and curriculum development. First being with PTO, our special events. We're going to be working with PTO to create Hadley Elementary School Spirit Weeks, allow staff and families to purchase school spirit wear, and bring in special performances. I've also started my monthly principal messages. I send out monthly messages through email, which is translated in multiple languages, specific to HES families, which allows me to give an in-depth report to families. And this is where I can update on curriculum development and refer back to those maps that we're going to be working so hard on. I will continue to be working with my school council to achieve school initiatives and increase family and community engagement. I will work on PBIS communications to families around highlighted monthly Hawk Wing initiatives. And if you have an HES student, I'm sure you've heard of some of these wonderful things that we've been doing, such as lunch with Officer Romano, which is probably our biggest ticket item. <laughs> Popcorn with the principal, not so popular yet, <laughs> but I'm working on it. Um, workout with Mrs. W and geocaching with Mr. Driver, which I'm really sure, I'm not really sure what that is yet. Um, we're just some of this month's examples. Lastly, the strategic objective D, professional culture, is to improve effectiveness of data teams through professional development and regular meetings to analyze impact of interventions on student behavior and achievement. We will measure our growth in this area by providing continue, continued MTSS data days. We do this three times a year in the fall, spring, fall, winter, and spring. And we've added two progress monitoring days where we're able to meet and analyze the data that we have in front of us. Grade level teams will analyze student specific behavior and achievement using MAP, FAST, and MCAS data. PBIS monthly team meetings will review SWIS data and share at staff meetings, parent meetings, and professional development days. For those of you who may not know, the SWIS suite is a reliable, confidential, web-based information system to collect, summarize, and use behavior data for decision making. We use it at HES to analyze documented minor and sometimes major behavior trends that can be student or school-wide specific. 
And lastly, by scheduling and providing grade level and professional development days, which will, again, allow staff to collaborate with team members in the alignment of the proposed social studies and science curriculum maps. Again, thank you for the opportunity to present my plan and be here tonight. Um, and I can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for the thorough overview. I really appreciate the information. And um, I guess I have a question for you, which is, you know, you mentioned the survey, which is something that, that um, you guys undertook this year. And we try to do, if not every year, every other year. What's, in your opinion, any other ways that the, the school committee can support your initiative? If anything comes to mind, we'd love to hear about it. Because if we can either seek out information or do something to support everything you've laid out, we'd love to hear those ideas. And it's really my hope to be able to share those ideas with you. I'm still new in my work at Hadley Elementary School, but I have to say I have a committed group of parents um, and staff members that really have been coming to me in the first couple of weeks and months, um, giving me ideas. Um, the, the parents have been very helpful and I've encouraged them, my door is always open to come and sit down and talk about how we can make the school more inviting and, and welcoming and student-based building. So um, when I get that information, I, I'll be happy to share that with you. Right. But the student survey results, um, the parent survey results rather, were very helpful in organizing this plan. And I, I thank you all for, for giving me that information because it really did help, help me in this process. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to add um, that I'm really glad that there are curriculum maps coming. As a parent, you know, we have visibility into maybe an individual classroom strategy, but the big picture is sort of lost upon me. And, uh, to have something as a guide for where my child needs to be every step of the way can help me be a good partner for, uh, to the teachers and help me make that happen on the classroom side. It was important to me as a parent as well because I do come home and ask those questions, well, what did you learn today? Mm -hmm. And I'm lucky if I get you know, an answer or two, so, <laughs> <laughs> especially if I'm pre-teen. Um, but really being able to provide parents that quick information that's accessible in one spot, but also then highlighted in monthly messages to families. This is what your third grader is learning in science this week or this month. Have a conversation around the dinner table. All of these are conversations that we want to facilitate, but give parents the information that they might necessarily not get. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great thing to disseminate the information too, because as we've talked a lot about in the past, Annie's weekly email is widely read and really, really useful. And I kind of, I, I personally like reading it at the end of the week. It's kind of like a wind down and it's kind of like a good feeling to kind of wrap up your your week to end and start your weekend fun. And I, I like the idea of you being able to disseminate that information that way. And I think it would be equally received in the elementary school because they do want more information. Yeah. Um, don't sell yourself short on the popcorn with the principal. Oh. <laughs> I just have, you know, I have to share this because you're here. And so my mother often does drop off at school. And so my son had waved to you one morning and my mom goes, oh, who's that? Is that one of your teachers? He goes, that's the principal. <laughs> and he kind of waves and smiles. So don't sell yourself short. Oh. <laughs> um, and one you can sign him up for popcorn. <laughs> yeah, you want to be careful about that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Spirit Week. I love the idea because Hopkins, when, when I was at Hopkins, we did the Spirit Week and that was so much fun for the kids. So just one thought, and I know that both schools are super busy, but just thinking back to getting kids excited about Hopkins, any way to incorporate, you guys probably already talked about this, why the nodding of your heads here, yeah. but incorporating the high school in any way possible to get those kids excited if it's the band coming over and doing a performance in the chorus or Anyway, even, even the soccer team, you know, just engaging them anyway, because that's always a highlight for those young guys to come in. Wasn't it last year they did a parade? Mm -hmm. um, graduation. And, graduation. Yes, and that was so exciting for And that was kids. an idea that came from the parent of um, a graduate who, in going through the ceremonies, you know, wanted to make some changes and made some positive suggestions and recommendations. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's really powerful about this community is that even when somebody sees something that, um, you know, they might not necessarily care for. It, it always comes with a suggestion or a recommendation, and 
when people are able to make that happen, and our, our class advisors last year, um, Terry Earl and Lindsay Roberts did a phenomenal job of making all of the logistics of that opportunity to work out. And our, our kids loved it because they had an opportunity to parade themselves through the hallway of the elementary school with it. So, yeah, yeah it's so great. anyway, yeah, they could be incorporated. That's, that's so fun. For, and it's fun for the older kids, too. Absolutely. To sh kind of show off their skills and have the younger kids. I'm really excited about the strong communication between Mr. Beck and I and, and with the whole administrative team because I really feel like we're going to be doing a lot of exciting things in the future. Um, and I would like to thank you for just, I think you've been the breath of fresh air at um, Hadley Elementary. Um, but, and then looking at the, uh, looking at what you have here for your, for your uh, strategy um, in both A and D, um, you talk about the, um, the grade level, the grade level meetings. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious what role special education will play in those, in those meetings to ensure that there's Communication between special education staff um, to meet the to meet the needs of all the students at all the grade levels, and to facilitate communication between regular education staff and special education staff. And I think a lot of that will be answered in um, Pam's presentation. But just speaking for myself, and again to highlight the fact that we are all working as a team together to support all students learning, um, really making sure that the special education staff has time, that they are a part of these meetings with the general ed teachers, because at the end of the day, they're all of our children, and so we wanna make sure that everyone's receiving the same messages, they have the same kind of input for these curriculum maps and documents, so making sure that you know this is all of our general collective work together to better benefit the students. And to just kind of jump in on that gap yeah. since it's, we're talking about it. So the, my goal will be to have the special educators um, at HES join the PD when they're working on the curriculum mapping so that right from the beginning they're already thinking about ways that they might need to provide accommodations or modify the curriculum so that all of our special education students can have access um, and be successful in learning the science and social studies curriculum. So. Um, you know, that could go, could be that we want to make sure the kids have copies of the notes ahead of time, or work for some students we might just focus on key vocabulary words that we want them to learn during, you know, the science or social studies unit. So kind of doing that right from the get-go while they're planning this out, we'll be ready to go when the students are in class. Excellent. Anything else from Stella? I just want one more thing. I'm, I'm really enjoying like the three of you sitting together just I, I just got this really good feeling right now you all seem to kind of be on the same wave flow and and the communication seems so great between all three of you and I'm sure Amy as well if she were sitting right there <laughs> but I just it, it's really encouraging and so I'm hoping that anybody that may be watching can kind of pick up on that too that you guys seem like a really good team so it's really encouraging. Yeah, it's been really nice as somebody who's been here, I think I've been here the longest of yeah. everybody, that um, to have an administrative team of people who are really thoughtful, um, very supportive of one another, and have a good sense of humor, and, and likewise to be able to sit uh, before a school committee who is so committed um, to having our students learn, not just at high levels, but really meaningful things in, in, in a, an exceptionally safe environment that we're constantly expected to make improvements, I think it sets an outstanding example um, for our teachers and for our students and helps the community to be able to step out and support our schools. Thank you. Well done, yeah. Excellent. Yes, official you. presentation to any school committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be taking tomorrow off. <laughs> no, Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to preface my, my presentation with an apology that a Hawkins student here has been here. Now, in the district since sixth grade has taken four direct communications for do not call me, I'm in a school committee meeting, <laughs> has called me twice, including the communication that took place within the first two minutes of the meeting in person. Do not call me, I'm in a school committee meeting, wait until after the meeting. Related to you. It's yeah. not yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the data for this particular plan uh, and information that's informed the strategy plan for Hopkins uh, for the 18-19 school year has come from MCAS. 
MCAS scores behavioral data input from students and parents, both in surveys as well as in person. Conversations and surveys we've had with students, um, including in student council and school council conversations, uh, as well as the results of the school committee survey and the decennial report from our New England Association of Schools and Colleges visit. Um, the first goal in instructional leadership is to improve middle school uh, math and science MCAS achievement and growth performance. I strongly, I do strongly believe that Hopkins Academy has all the characteristics to become the strongest performing school with the strongest performing students in the state of Massachusetts. We have highly involved and supportive families, an exceptional faculty, a community that supports its schools, and students who are motivated to learn and grow. We're taking a very different approach this year to making improvements than we have in the past. And the key to this really has been the leadership of math department chair Susan Horowitz and her math department colleagues. Um, starting off the year in an examination of the data, not focusing on what is covered and how we covered math curriculum, but rather on, on this year on how students learn mathematics. In, in addition to the logistical aspects that you can see in the plan of increasing the frequency of MCAS practice with a variety of MCAS problems and, and practicing computer-based testing from time to time so that students at least have a degree of comfort and familiarity with the problems they'll see in the format. The department is engaging in a year-long professional learning community centered around uh, a text um, and a professional opportunity that's been extended by the Department of Education and Dr. McKenzie has been good enough to connect us so that each of us have textbooks. Um, in the first meeting, first department meeting, Ms. Horowitz asked her team to approach a problem as though they were a student. They engaged in a discussion about how it felt to approach the problem, look at what would benefit the students and allow them to attack the problem with confidence, even if the students had not been familiar with all aspects of the problem that was sitting in front of them. So, in general, we're seeking to change this year to change our instructional approach to model the thinking process for students rather than just reviewing solutions to problems with students as a matter of routine. We'll need to increase the number of activities that require students to apply their learning and dialogue and discussion about their approach to problem solving, thus facilitating the process of students learning how to speak and become, effectively becoming fluent in mathematics. We're adding fast the fast progress monitoring tool, which has been used successfully at the elementary school to gather data over the course of the year. So that we've already started to implement these instructional strategies from a very early stage in the school year when we first looked at the data coming out of our first department meeting of the, of the school year in the opening day. Um, teachers in, in the middle school and really a, a, across the high school as well for students in grades seven through 10 um, are frequently practicing problems as activators or as follow-up or as homework assignments in small segments, and then engaging in dialogue about how they solve the problem um, and walking through and modeling that information, uh, modeling that process for one another. I'm very excited about the efforts in the research foundation um, of the plan that have already been implemented at this early stage of the school year. In science, um, there is three years worth of uh, vocabulary that um, appears on the eighth grade science test because the, the previous MCAS science assessment takes place in the fifth grade. And so our science department has already revised its curriculum and they're also going to stay connected with the work at the elementary level because that's going to inform students coming in. And what they're seeking to do this year is develop a set of interim assessments that provide them the opportunity, even at this early stage of the, of the school year, to get a sense of how much the sixth and, uh, sixth and seventh grade voc science vocabulary that students will need to apply um, in the eighth grade, as well as know for the MCAS test, uh, is known by students and, and that they have a, a working functional knowledge of, of that information so that they're going to be better prepared for the study in eighth grade and that therefore be better prepared for the test. So we're looking to develop that interim assessment and use that information over the course of the year to modify instruction to ensure that our students, you know, if they need reinforcement of particular terminology, because really it now, it shouldn't be new terminology to them, that we can take the time with a target group or do the work with an entire group of students. In management and operations, um, I think this is something that's a very, very positive uh, project that we're fortunate enough to have several resources available to us, including work that's been done over the last several years it's the implementation of a civic engagement and dialogue project for our students. As a school community, many of our stakeholder groups have consistently shared the desire for more opportunities for civic engagement and dialogue, as well as understand 
it, 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 that it's at the very core as a necessity for all of us to have in order for our government to be successful in a democratic republic. As a faculty and staff, we all understand and firmly, firmly believe in the responsibility we have to prepare each of our students to become effective citizens and to cultivate the skills in those who wish to be prepared to become civic leaders. Over the past two years, student and faculty leadership has allowed us to engage in important dialogue about challenging topics such as racism and sexism. These programs have not only had a positive impact on our climate and culture, but have also provided us with the logistical models as, uh, that will provide us a foundation for being able to implement this project. <clears throat> with this work as a foundation, the district has secured a grant through the work of uh, Dr. McKenzie um, with the Novo Foundation for Social Emotional Learning to implement a civic engagement dialogue project with the following objectives. The school will organize four civ civic engagement and policy dialogue sessions for students at Hopkins Academy. Trained student facilitators, selected through an application and, and interview process, will moderate carefully structured dialogue sessions. Student facilitators will work in pairs with faculty observers. Dialogue sessions support students to develop the skills necessary to engage in civil discourse in school and society. Because the dialogue sessions encu encourage relational dialogue rather than debate, Dialogue sessions are designed to support students in, a largely, in largely homogeneous districts and communities to develop skills to engage respectfully and thoughtfully in a diverse democracy, support young people to communicate across difference, reduce conscious and unconscious bias, increase students' self-awareness, self-regulation, ability to listen, ability to ask questions, and ability to suspend judgment when in conflict, and foster a more inclusive and safer school environment. We're currently taking applications from students in all grades who wish to be trained as, facil as facilitators and are eager to begin the work and training for students and staff through our partnership with the Collaborative for Educational Services who will provide um, the training for both our students and for our faculty. In the category of family and community engagement, we discussed with school council um, and one of these projects took a slightly different shape the other night as, as we discussed it. Um, we had initially planned to do some outreach, and I'll talk about that in the, in the next topic um, in a slightly different way, and they decided they wanted to uh, tie it back into um, the civic dialogue project directly. Uh, this particular uh, family and community engagement activity is to organize and implement a family career, uh, sorry, organize and implement an annual career fair. We believe the students learn better when they are motivated to engage in their courses, their homework, test projects, and they are able to connect it to a, the educational foundation that for each of us is the, is the basis of our future choices and uh, options and opportunities for employment. We thought we'd take on uh, tackling the age-old question that students ask all the time, why do I need to know this? As a school council, we wanted to bring back and make an annual event of a career fair for all students. Over last year, we had a discussion about what time of year it might be best to do, thinking of those pockets of time when, you know, like the day before Christmas, although our teachers don't turn it into Golden Hawk Theater, you know, there is still learning that goes on, there, are, there is still assessments that students and staff uh, on those days can be a little down, and, and very often folks come home, and that might be a good opportunity to have somebody um, who's an alum, who, you know, recently has uh, gone into a field and can provide us with an opportunity. Um, but may not necessarily be the best time of year. In the spring, um, students and faculty are deep into their learning already. Um, and we saw this opportunity in October where the district calendar provides us with uh, an early release day, the day after, on the Friday after um, parent-teacher conferences as part of the contract. And so that seemed to be a time when heading into a weekend, it will always be on a Friday, that we could still potentially attract alums who might be able to make it home or miss classes for a day, um, but also look at addressing that question, why do I have to know this, while students still have the learning in front of them for the school year. Um, in conversations that we had with members of the faculty who are still left here from when the career, career fairs used to be done, um, we realized that we needed a little bit more in terms of resources. And the school council will be reaching out over the course of the year to parents, to students, as well as the faculty, um, to develop some consensus around what career interests they have, and then we'll begin reaching out, and, and probably to the school committee, if you were gonna ask the same question that you asked of Ms. Dowd, um, 
really being able to identify people who have different career orientations out there to come in as practitioners and, and engage in a format where they can um, deliver a, a brief presentation for our kids. Uh, our kids will be able to select whichever ones they want to go to and we'll create a format and hopefully have that in place for years to come on, on that first Friday of October every year. Our next activity um, also falls into the category of uh, community um, engage, community engagement. And this involves connecting the social emotional learning grant work with the community. A few years ago, we received positive feedback from a variety of sources, from a variety of people in the community for the student-led dialogue sessions that were held for parents in March of 2015 and March of 2016, which really created the basis of the dialogue that we're having around the development of our core values, beliefs, and student learning, uh, our core values and beliefs about student learning, as well as addressing issues of programming um, and making changes to the curriculum and communication tools. Parents were impressed by and appreciative of the opportunity to engage in conversations with other people's children in the school about very important issues. And what we saw was an elevation of the level of play of members of the community who weren't going to stand up there and be disrespectful to anybody else's kid. And were gen had genuine curiosity about their perceptions about the school while students drew out of them their thoughts and beliefs and um, things that they wanted to see in the school community and made note of them and passed them on to us. And so that was a, those sessions were very well received by parents and the school council went back to that as if we were to take the Novo trained students and the TAB trained students and put them together and survey the community in the same way that we do about the career fair to identify the most pressing or interesting political topics that are out there that are local, regional, um, statewide, and national and international, that we could then have students be prepared to facilitate dialogue sessions between parents in the community who might want to come in and engage in, in, in this dialogue. And so we like the idea of exploring that and, and um, we're hopeful that our students as we begin to select our, tab, our, our, our trained active bystanders for this year, that they'll be prepared uh, and excited about engaging in that activity with parents and inviting them in. And then our last activity is um, wrapping up the completion of our school-wide academic expectations. The objective is to have these concluded by January. At this stage of the process, we've gathered input from parents, students, and the faculty, and have consulted extensive re research about the skills that students need to enable them to be effective learners in the 21st century. We are now at the stage where we're beginning to model draft language with the intent of voting on a revised set of school-wide learning expectations no later than January. These will then be communicated to the entire school community and we'll begin the process of identifying the tools that we'll use to measure student and school-wide achievement of each of those expectations. Thank you. No, our, our, it's, it's an enormous undertaking, and part of the reason we hoped to have it last spring, um, and we tabled it, you know, what we were looking at was that date, that um, a date that fits in that time between athletic seasons, where the tournament time usually wraps up in the first or second week of March, um, or is wrapped up by the second week of March, and athletic teams are just beginning practices in the third week of March. And so during that time, we know we have no games that will create conflicts. That's a good time to invite the community in because you know, there are no other activities that go on. What the council decided instead was, to, let's use that time for the dialogue sessions. And let's plan something thoroughly for the fall that we can then use as a model from year to year so that we're creating something that is like a structure that we can pop things into and you know, reach out to the, the various organizations, Helping Hearts, the Board of Trustees, look at what resources we currently have 
so that if there's anything that we need to do financially in terms of providing small honorariums, like a little bit of gas money for somebody who's traveling from Connecticut or New Jersey or something like that, that we're able to do that, um, or providing them with food so that after a day of providing our students with that service, they can sit around and munch with each other, you know, down here in the cafeteria with some food that's been provided by, you know, the, the organizations in the community that, that support student learning. So putting something together, um, again, targeted toward next year, we'd be looking to have everything in place by June so that next September when students come back, we have them excited about the career fair and they can begin the process of registering for that within the first couple of weeks of school. And you mentioned this, but the idea of uh, former, you know, or Hopkins graduates, alumni coming back and talking about how what they did here has benefited them in the real world, I think that just hits home for a lot of students, you know, hearing it from a peer rather than necessarily a, a person in the business world that sure. they don't know. And there are some that are still out there, like some of the most intriguing conversations I've had have been with students, uh, college students who have been in their junior, senior year or moving on to grad school. And they've done overseas, a, a semester overseas or they've managed to secure an internship in a really interesting set of circumstances in their career field. Um, and I, I kept thinking, how can we get students in to see other students? So one of the other things that we may do is, is um, consider having a, just a forum of current college students who are alumni um, and put them in a central location like the cafeteria and in places where you know students don't have a session that they've gone to they can select to go to that particular session so every student has a place to go but it'll also provide them a, an opportunity to consult on well what's college like you know what, what, what was it like when you went to the Mass Maritime Academy uh, what's it like in the Coast Guard you know so um, being able to hear different information and, and be able to ask those questions will hopefully allow them at that particular point in the school year to begin to attach the rest of the year's learning to something you know that they can see their future. I would say too, even if it's so juniors and seniors, yes, but even bringing it even back another year to sophomores, somebody who's younger that may have spent some of their high school time and might recognize that familiar face might make it even that more exciting. Just to kind of know, because again, we've talked about how has Hopkins prepared you for um, college and whatnot, and so that would be another good way to kind of tie it in and kind of, even if a student had to say, well, what, you know, what would I have done differently? What would I have looked at? When I was in high school, what I would have done was explored A, B, and C, and it might even provide school committee or staff some different ideas. <coughs> There's something else I was going to say. Oh, um, it, it, I'm kind of trying to wrap my head about the idea of how this would be organized, but Another thought that I have is, again, trying to figure out how to get those sixth graders coming over to the high school, trying to, you know, they're extending it to the entire community somehow, which I know might be more challenging, or even in a, in a forum or, you know, information session, maybe that night or something separate from the career fair, but something that, you know, those fifth and sixth graders are making their decision as to whether or not they're going to come to Hopkins or go to Frontier or look at a different school or even if they're going to go to um, a different route of education for their high school. It may sway them if they are in a room with current Hopkins students and kids that went there because, again, even at that young age, maybe we can pull some kids in. I don't know how possible it would be or not, but I so, think Miss Dowd is just going to hire a bus once a week randomly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just I'm just going to drop them in the parking lot. <laughs> Here's the sixth graders. Yeah. No, but, but I hear what you're saying, and I do think that it's a really important point because I think the ability to, to keep the students that we have and really right. foster those relationships with the students at Hopkins will allow us, you know, that connection between the schools and they'll be more likely to stay and go. Right, and make it more exciting and, yeah. and less intimidating, yeah. you know, something like, wow, I really want to go to Hopkins because that Hopkins grad did this, this, and this, and look at where they are now, that, I really want that. You, you never know what sixth graders or fifth graders If you wouldn't mind, just send me an email that just quite simply says, can you touch base with the school council on how they might be able to wrap the sixth grade into the career fair? Yeah, yeah. And that would be like enough. A reception, as you were saying, at the evening yeah. before at Pathway Elementary School, inviting all the students um, to come in and have an open house more informally could be really interesting. Absolutely. Stations of different um, 
alumni speaking. Parents too, because at that age too, it's really the parent that's playing a big role, and so the parent can then feel more comfortable and where they you know if their kid's kind of on the fence, but the parent goes, oh, look at this up, you know? It's a great point. I will say there's an online series of tests you can take that help you figure out what you want to be when you grow up. And my whole family has taken it. And one of my sons, uh, in his top 10 were taxidermy and being a potter. So cool. we expect to see those at the fair. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> so Pfeiffer, have you taken the test? I did. I should be a bank manager. Oh, really? No. I know, huh? No offense, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. Um, I do have a couple questions. Um, there were some themes that came up in the parent survey um, that I'm not sure fully addressed in your plan. Um, primarily communication with the parents, um, understanding the curriculum that's happening at the school, um, and, um, and student safety, and a, and a perception of, af of af athletes versus non-athletes. Um, and so I was just curious how you plan, on, if, if you plan on, on really targeting some of those things that came up in the, in the parent survey as some things that parents would really like to see worked on. Yeah, I think obviously um, the social emotional learning grant uh, specifically targets safety. You know, um, we've, we've done a significant amount of safety work around the logistics of the school with public safety personnel and um, changing our protocols for a variety of safety drills uh, and, and, and processes for a variety of situations but at the same time and students did ask for that as well um, as we saw things occur in the news but we've we've really had to focus over the last couple of years around engaging being able to engage in dialogue and, and, and discussions around difficult topics rather than just waiting for students to make a mistake in, in an, an issue of bias, you know, making a, an inappropriate remark about the way that somebody looks or the way that somebody moves or the color of their skin or their gender and stereotyping. And I think the work that has been done has laid a foundation and I think this provides us the opportunity to address concerns about our differences with one another as a matter of opening up conversations and enabling people to be more willing to have conversations. I think last year, also, we did a significant amount of work last year in pulling, pulling in the faculty reporting network and, and other vehicles that we have uh, in place for students to be able to report to adults. And you know, despite that, I think that we'd be really ignorant to believe even for a moment that we have a completely safe school environment. I think any school would be. Um, the, the challenge of throwing 300 people together in a building every day and assuring that we're all going to go without having a conflict or being upset with each other is just ludicrous. And the, the fact that we're addressing um, the need for people to be able to engage in those conversations, in those arguments, in those discussions, having those confrontations with one another um, is really important work and I think that that's, that's addressed in the plan. Uh, it's not in the plan, but um, following uh, Jennifer's process of doing also, a, you know, a monthly newsletter at the at the start of the month, um, and and also adding some communications to students that will be sent out, you know, on Friday, um, as well as after uh, school cancellations and snow days, where we have a rotating schedule, and one of the biggest stressors for students is, oh my God, what day is tomorrow? You know, because they have to know what homework they need to do, and while they seem to plan well on the way out and take all of their materials, they, they can't necessarily remember by the time they get to Sunday, and the informal Snapchat stream goes crazy trying to find out, hey, what day is tomorrow? Um, and so really starting there. And then the work on, on the, the curriculum is really being done by the district to be able to put it into um, a structure that can be shared publicly, you know, pre-K through 12. And so that work really is underway, and I didn't feel like it was appropriate or reasonable to take work that, um, really is more logistical than, um, than the work that we need to really be supported and have people buy into heavily um, that's already in a way and then throw that into a plan and make it look like a 40 point improvement plan. And these, that, that allows us to really be able to focus on, on these items and, and hopefully successfully implement each of these items. And if we do, I believe we're gonna have a better, stronger school community. And actually, let me just rephrase my, my comment about the uh, school safety. Um, there were some specific comments and concerns related to bullying 
and incidents where students reported bullying to faculty and didn't feel that faculty was that responsive to their, to their concerns. Um, so that's just something that I would like to state that would be great to see some, some um, improvements made. Absolutely, and I, I, I look forward to, again, the, it, it would be my hope and, and my intent, and, and that's part of the, the data that we look at in the survey to put something in place, like being able to engage somebody in dialogue, um, making sure that the active bystander curriculum is being implemented and that students who are trained as active bystanders feel safe intervening and then reporting. You know, it's not enough for a student to just intervene. Bring an adult in on it. It's not always that we have to um, take disciplinary action. Sometimes we can pull students together and resolve the conflict before it spirals out of control. Um, so it would, it would, what I would look toward as evidence of have we succeeded is we look at the next school committee survey or any surveys that we do with parents and we hope that those numbers change two years from now as a result of the work that we've done. So. I, I haven't seen your emails yet in terms of summarizing other activities, but your point about, um, you know, we often highlight athletics because we have some very strong athletic teams and, and the season seems to be never ending on some of these, <laughs> like soccer, <laughs> that will continue on. Um, but I like seeing the highlights of other activities that students are doing, whether it's hiking up Mount Kilimanjaro or robotics, you know, things like that, that you're right, are really showcasing the broad talents that we have in the student body. So I would just encourage, you know, in your emails and to continue in yours, um, highlighting those things that may not be directly school-sponsored um, activities, but are really seen as when they're read by families in the community as a showcase of our talent and our students. In, and again, also, I hope that um, Dr. McKenzie's weekly email also inspires parents to share information directly with us as an administrative team. There are so many students who do so many accomplished things in the community, so you know, we're fortunate enough to have a state gymnastics champion back from seventh grade, um, a hockey team who won a tournament, you know, even though they're, these are students from our community. Um, a, a tenth grader this year who won first place with his cow at uh, the Big E. I mean, those are things that are worth celebrating because those things that students engage in outside the community, although not directly related to school, they bring those talents and those skills into the school community and share it with, uh, with our children. And so it's nice for parents to hear that your kids go to school with some pretty amazing kids. I am a ridiculous consumer of chocolate milk. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Will that be in the next? Uh, so that student, Jacksina, was highlighted last week. Uh, spoiler alert, we have two elementary students who were honorary captains for a UMass team this past weekend. But you will have to read this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> things that I want to um, touch on um, to follow up with what Jen and Brian have presented tonight. Um, first, I did also want to just thank you for having us all here tonight. We have, um, I do feel like we've been uh, working hard as an administrative team, getting to know one another and working together with what our priorities are. So I do think we all are truly feeling pretty good about that. Um, so as the new special education director, I um, just want to kind of share with the committee that we're, I am definitely committed to ensuring that all students, regardless of their disability, have the opportunity to progress in all academic areas, regardless of their disability, um, and working in the least restrictive environment as possible. Um, and I believe that this is done most effectively by working directly with the teachers and the staff and then partnering with families. So I really feel that collectively we're all part of a team working together and that if we can do that, we're gonna have good outcomes for students. Um, so to touch on some of the work that Jen is gonna be focusing on at HES, where I see my role in kind of working with Jen and the staff at HES is, um, the first thing is through the FAST data team meeting. So really um, working harder this year to have special education teachers be more involved in the FAST process. Um, They've already started attending the data meetings, but continuing to strengthen that so that they can be 
you know, in the data team meeting, we're looking at the data and then we're collaborating and determining, you know, where there's student deficits. So, you know, that's working with the general ed teachers, the special educators, um, our Title I reading teacher, the MTSS ESPs, so that we're all working together to kind of sort out where do we need to target instruction for all students, not just our special education students. Um, so definitely see a strong role in really wanting to um, kind of push that forward even more this year. Um, I'm also excited to have the special educators start doing some more progress monitoring through FAST. There's so many um, great opportunities through the FAST program, um, and I, you know, my previous district we did a lot with FAST, so I'm really familiar with um, a lot of the ways we can monitor progress for students. Um, and really kind of just goes back to the same theme that I really do uh, feel so strongly about is that when we can all work together, when we're doing this universal screening, we can really target areas of deficit for students and then provide the instruction to, you know, to um, reduce those deficits um, and have them make progress. Um, the other thing that I'll be working with Jen and the teachers on, which I already spoke about, was around the curriculum mapping. So I am excited about that so that when our students, you know, science and social studies typically are always areas that students are, especially students are in the classroom for those times. Um, and so we want them to feel like they're part of that classroom instruction and really able to um, participate and be successful. So I'm excited to work with Jen and the teachers to um, have our, the special educators really work on those maps as well. Um, to touch on at Hopkins, you know, since starting last year, I've been super impressed with the leadership and the commitment that all of the Hopkins teachers have um, towards inclusion best practices. Um, when I sit in team meetings, just the commitment they have to wanting to include all the students, have them be successful. So kind of jumping off of that, really continuing to work with collaboration between the special educators and the general education teachers on how we can improve that collaboration so that when they're coming to the special educator for support, we know exactly what kind of is going on in their content area classes so we can support that in their academic support classes. Um, and then when they're in those gen ed classes, what are the expectations for them so that the gen ed teachers definitely have this very high expectations. They want to have a real strong rigor for all students, including our special education students. So um, we've been working hard. I've been meeting with some of the teachers and the special educators on how, and Brian, on how we can really um, make sure we're all on the same page and we're working collaboratively to achieve that. So, so those are the areas I think I'm going to focus most on this year, um, and then continuing to work with Annie, Brian, and Jen. Things done. Okay. Any questions? I just want to say that I'm really happy, Pam, that you've taken over this role. I think that you've proven yourself a really good resource and um, somebody that's really available to parents. And um, I do know that just from the CPAC um, family. Family fun engagement day. afternoon. <laughs> yes. Family fun day. <laughs> so very fun. Um, it can get really easy to get bogged down in like, ah, it's the same people. How do we reach out to people? And one thing that struck me in conversation while we're at that is, yes, you're aware of that, but then you're constantly thinking, well, it, it, you're focusing on the positive and, fo and focusing on the optimistic. Well, we could do this, or we could do that, or here's some ways we could get people involved. So. I think you, you play a really important role with community engagement as well within the special education world, but then extending it so that that special education world has a place in general education. So I just, I, I think you're doing a really good job with communication. And so I'm also very excited to hear the collaboration that you're gonna have with both the elementary school and the high school. So I'm just I'm excited. Thank you. I would like to echo what, what Tara said, and it might look like I'm texting, but I swear I'm like, <laughs> writing notes. And, talking about it. Um, and it is it is great to see it is great again seeing you as as a, as a face of special education and education for all the students. Um, I'm just also curious um, where you see yourself in facilitating conversations between special education and right and general education staff to ensure that. Um, and that instruction is being individualized for all students and meeting them where they are. 
and also um, what trainings um, will, if there are any, if you're trying to make any additional trainings available um, for special ed staff, including ESPs and special educators, um, to make sure that they are adequately trained to meet the needs of the students. Um, so the first question about kind of working with the general education teachers, they're definitely, I feel like, um, I feel like, I think I'm doing a good job with making sure my door is open because it's, um, the teachers definitely come to me with specific student questions and so then we, we just really are able to have those conversations about um, whether it's like what to do about a math test or how, you know, how, you know, this student didn't do really well on this test, what should I do? So we're having those conversations all the time, like truly every week about where I feel like the teachers come to me with those specific questions. So I definitely want those conversations to continue. Um, we'll often meet after school, um, before school or during prep times to kind of pulling in like the special educator, myself and the team of teachers, depending on the grade levels so that we can have those conversations. Um, so I definitely think that's so important. I mean, each student um, in special education is, you know, very unique and individual, so there's no, you can't just have like a one blanket conversation around that. So um, it's definitely sometimes a revolving door, but, uh, but it's okay because it's all good. Sometimes she says, go ask Jen, <laughs> which I welcome as well, because we work as a team. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. um, in terms of the training opportunities, um, Annie and I were just chatting about that today, um, is specifically for the ESPs and wanting to kind of, we talked about we're gonna put out like a little survey um, where we wanna get some input from them on what they're looking for, what they're struggling with in the school and what they need more support on, and then um, set up a meeting both here at Hopkins and at the elementary school. So if they wanna come to meet with us, in addition to filling out the form, then we can have those conversations on what types of um, support and trainings that we need to do for them. At the start of the year, um, I did do a little training with um, the ESP around really fostering independence with students. So um, definitely students need support from the ESPs, but I don't want it to be that they become so dependent on the support that then they you know, literally wait for someone to come tell them to take out their book or, you know, their homework, you know, so just kind of did a little training in PowerPoint with them on just how to start fostering some of that independence with students. And then, and the ESPs from Hopkins and HES came to that, so definitely open to hear, I'm anxious to hear what they have to bring to the table, so. And I would just like to go back to, I think it's, it's, it's something that was mentioned earlier, it's great seeing the three of you here together and, um, along with the one Manny who's having this team, um, and it's really, it, it's 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 really awesome. Like I, I, it, it's a feeling that I haven't really had sitting over here. So it's just great. Thank you. We can start a Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> and you'd be impressed that continue. administrative meetings are as productive as they are. I don't are, think that's on our agenda. That's true. <laughs> So we've linked specific PD activities that are occurring this year with each one of those standards for effective practice. Also know that, uh, and these are coming in now, each teacher is invited each year to complete their professional development form for the year. They can participate in a professional learning community. So for example, many teachers are doing their curriculum mapping as part of their professional learning community. They can do an independent inquiry project and they submit those to their principal, and then I review all of those too. And if they meet the criteria for the math standards for professional development, the district can issue them PDPs, professional development points, which they need for their licenses. So there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on in those professional learning communities as well. Again, I just wanted you to know 
that we have a cohesive district plan and there's also independent work and it's aligned to the individual school plans. Um, Mike, did you have questions? About that? So my goals, just a reminder that every year these are proposed goals, so it's always open for discussion or anything you'd like to see. I intentionally align each goal with the standards that you're required by law to evaluate me on. That kind of allows you to say, well, if we see some progress toward the goal, we can make some determinations about proficiency on the standards. So we just try to streamline that for you. And I did also specifically um, try to include some of the things that um, the school committee had indicated that I know are important to the school committee that don't relate directly to uh, the improvement plans in each of the schools. So one of those is fostering community support, financial support for the HA Athletic Fields Project, uh, launching the student recruitment website, which we are well on our way. We anticipate that will be out right around the holidays, which is good. It's also right around budget season and um, school shopping season and collaborating with town and our various support groups to host a community fair. So those are outside of the uh, school strategy documents. Do you have any recommendations, request of revisions? Would you like to consider it? Have me bring it back again next month. I will do whatever you would like. Ultimately, the goals are the school committee. We come to mutual agreement, but I work for you the last time I checked. <laughs> So it's um, the, the, as the action item, the package of the district strategy and the superintendent goals, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions or concerns? Do we want to act on this tonight, or do we need time to review them at the next meeting? I reviewed it. My question is, um, so then at the end of the year, we do your performance about mm -hmm. it. So we'd be holding you accountable for these expected outcomes. Mm -hmm. There is one in there about 100% funding for the fields. Uh, yes. So <laughs> that's, not, that's not fully within your control. So I don't know if it's the, I just worry that that would yeah. be. So when you do this, so that's an aspirational goal. Okay. Remember when you, and I can certainly change it, but that is my goal. I mean, I really. Sure. <laughs> and and you, you do exceeded uh, significant progress met some progress okay. and remember it's this very mushy kind of performance art thing that happens so it's it's not absolutely okay. linear i appreciate you being mindful of that but i just gosh darn it yeah no, I, <laughs> I know you are Paul. Yeah. that's a good point i mean it's an expected improvement right yeah. so but it's also, as you were saying, I think that it also shows commitment towards, mm -hmm. you know, moving as close to that 100%, you know, needle right. mark as we can. Yeah. Any other questions? Are we comfortable with moving forward with this as an action item tonight? Yeah. Okay. Then. Um, I'll ask if there is a motion for, it's really two things, the district strategy and the superintendent goals for 18-19. Motion to adopt the district strategy and the superintendent goals for 18 and 19. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now we are moving to the Hartsburg graduation. I'm sorry, yeah, you're oh, too what? bad you don't want to go. Graduation. Yeah, I still have I still have that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fine. I, was, I, was, I was out in the hallway answering the phone. It was my kid calling from your kid's phone. <laughs> my kid's here? He uh, masked. Oh, he masked his, his <laughs> my kid's here too? They're scheming. No, uh, so. no they're. They were at your house plotting to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that it, his child got the message that he couldn't call, but maybe he used somebody else's phone. How is yes. it? I thought you to pick up the caller ID. <laughs> nice. Okay, so Hartsbrook School this, is next. Yes, and this happens every year. It's in your packet. Um, I have visited. I have checked that they have met all the requirements. Uh, criteria set forth in your policy, and I do recommend that you approve their operation. Can you just remind me why we do they don't have a school committee in their form? It is not only just our policy, it is a requirement, I think, of law, so that they are a private um, school operating in our vicinity, and so we give them 
approval to operate. And they do have, I do believe they have a board, they have a governing structure, but they don't have an elected school committee, no. Same with the charter school and really any school operating in has the East Not, so not the school. charter school. Oh. Not the charter school, because they are considered a public school and they do have a board of directors. They're like a single school district almost. Um, so that's a public school, but this is a private school. But every so every private school across the state has goes through this process. Yeah, they should be uh -huh. um, being reviewed by the school committee, the elected school committee of the towns that they operate in. And also, you have your policy. Right. Well, thank you for reviewing, confirming that they're meeting all of the necessary requirements. So there's a motion to adopt it or to support it. Uh, I think motion would be um, approval yeah. of part Yeah, uh, uh, yes. The, you're approving, literally approving the school, the private school approval process. You're approving the operation. Seems strange, but you want That's what you're doing. Is there a motion to approve Hartsbrook, Hartsbrook School operations for the 18-19 year? I move to support the Hartsbrook private school operations 2018-19. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I just wonder what happens if we said no. <laughs> Especially now it's October. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would think they'd want to know why, and it yeah. doesn't sound like you know, they're violating any of the requirements. Good. Okay. Brian, you are up again. The Hopkins graduation date. Yeah, so in, um, in the course, I had a meeting with uh, the senior class officers the second day of school with their initiative to talk about the things that we planned down toward the end of the year and they wanted to get their financial house in order and make sure that they were going to be able to have a good year and so on and so forth and they knew they'd be going over to Smith Academy. Smith is hosting that end of year event this year as we alternate back and forth and um, they really liked it. The officers in particular worked it here this year and had a blast. Like wow, this, this is a really fun day. Um, and in the course of that conversation, they said, well, have you picked a graduation date yet? And I said, well, it's always been the first Friday of June. And they had mentioned, well, you know, that other schools are graduating on the 31st. And it, it occurred to me that um, we, to the best of my knowledge, that it has traditionally been the first Friday evening in the month of June has been the graduation date of Hopkins Academy. So I went to D-Rex and I looked in policy with the we didn't find any policy related to um, graduation date, and Dee had prompted me to make sure that I was living within the regulations, so I went to the law, and the, the law actually indicates that school committee has to vote the graduation date. And so that being said, I wanted to bring it forward as an agenda item. Um, um, Dr. McKenzie, Dee Rex, and Susan Giza pulled together the information from the last couple of years of um, graduation dates and, and of senior activities and so forth so that you can see um, for the last three or four years I believe it's been at the, the week of after Labor Day and so the four day week has not stood in the way as, a, as an obstruction um, but uh, in the absence of policy that the school committee will need to vote on the graduation date rather than us just communicating that well, this is the graduation date because it's the way we've always done it and so I just wanted to bring it forward the way that we're supposed to and I'm somewhat ambivalent. I know that the seniors would like would prefer the 31st to the 7th. That does have its advantages. Um, and uh, in terms of moving the students along sooner, it also coordinates with the Smith Academy's graduation date, which would not be necessarily a reason that you should consider. Um, but you know, the students certainly are not ambivalent. They would prefer to do the 31st to the 7th. And this, of course, they falls in a year when they have the latest possible graduation date amongst the all of those first Fridays in June. So. so school typically closes two weeks after graduation date? So, it, right, because it can't by law right. um, be any more than 12 school days after. And we did learn, thanks to Mr. Beck, you will be approving graduation every year going forward since yeah. we said, well, look at that. That's what the law says. So that's what you'll be doing. Said, I remember doing it. Yeah. No, you haven't before. So we're going to start to. So, so does that mean past year students didn't actually graduate? Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're a very popular man. <laughs> so how many school days would this be before 
the regular closing date if we I believe it's the, the 10th or the 11th day. Yeah, it's the 10th day. Okay. So it's within the 12 days. Within the 12 days. Not affected by school days? No. It's snow days? Is that snow what you mean? Yes. No. No, it's regularly scheduled. Just as regular. The last, yeah, 12 school days before the regular scheduled closing date of school. So that's why you have the regular scheduled closing date. Take out your weekends. There's 10 days in between the 31st. I think DESE recognizes through that regulation that they can't control the end of the school year, but that graduations are events that need to be planned well in advance. I would say this is a, this is a little bit of a bizarre year that, that Friday is so far into, as far as possibly can be, into the problem, into, into uh, the problem one. Um, I guess my only question would be, you mentioned that there are advantages, I guess my only question would be, are there any disadvantages, and so what are they? Well, uh, I asked the class advisors, uh, Kathy Nigella is um, one of the two class advisors for the senior class, and she said, she was ambivalent other than, you know, she was concerned about um, the instructional time left for exams and so forth for seniors, which would require forward planning. Last year was June 1st. There's one less day than there was last year, so I don't see it as a substantial obstruction because it, you know, it literally was one day. Um, it's probably that concern is most pressing for students who would be taking the final advanced placement exam or two which is on the 17th or 18th. And I, I think we have just students in VHS courses, which means we would have one or two students taking those final uh, advanced placement exams, and those would be the students who would be most impacted. But they do also have makeup time for us here at school where they can take care of that well in advance of the week of senior activities so that uh, all of the grades can be submitted um, in the week prior. And then that, that week leading up to graduation would be senior class trip rehearsals. Um, and all of the activities that uh, surround um, their final week of school. Thank you. So if there's no real law that says it has to be in June, it seems silly to keep them in for an extra week and it's not going to impact the curriculum or really anything just to make it the first Friday in June. Mm -hmm. okay. I would agree with that. Yeah, agreed. Where does Memorial Day fall in here? It's fine. not, oh, yeah. So we'll never graduate them on the Friday before the Right. Right. Uh, we yeah. wouldn't do people travel, so that yeah. we go prior to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, any yeah. concerns with going with the 31st? Sounds like that would be advantageous potentially to the class, more in line with what other districts are doing. Um, and one day less than of instruction, one day tighter than what we had last year. But it still falls. It still falls. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall I make a motion? motion? Go for it. Move to have graduation day on May 31st, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And by the way, I know you had to walk out for a call earlier, but thank you again for your um, presentation and the presentation of strategies and approaches. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank so. you. I didn't, I didn't mean to be rude because unlike Keith, I was actually texting. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as he said that, I'm like, oh, I'm actually texting. <laughs> Your son texted me. He thanked you too. <laughs> we get happy. We just are going to be filling shortly the point eight adjustment counselor position that we have uh, open. And yeah. Okay. Public comment period. Oh, the public has left. Okay. Business manager report. Chris, expenses. Okay, so yeah, we can start out with the expense report. Um, not really too much to report here other than. Uh, the situation is similar to what it was last month and that you might see some lines that look way over budget um, and that's because and I'm only going to use this as an example but like the out of district tuition account we have a good portion of that going to a grant we have another good portion of it going to school choice we typically won't transfer that until later on in the school year 
Um, the final grants have been applied for, they have not yet been approved, so we can't do any transfers to those until we get approval for them. Some were approved last week. Title I was approved, Title II, and Title IV. Those are all um, salary lines. So any kind of salaries that you see, we will be transferring money over to those. So um, there are a number of items like that. In addition, we had to cut the budget down uh, in June with the hope that um, what we needed would be returned to us after the fall town meeting. That money was returned, so now I need to adjust the budget item, the line items to reflect that uh, return of the money. So again, you know, you might see something and you'll say, wow, there was only $700 budgeted and we've already spent 15. Odds are that it was probably $2,000 or something budgeted. And you know, again, once those are adjusted, you'll see them in here and it won't look quite as bad. I should have caught this before, Chris, so I'm gonna, I, I apologize for not catching it and asking this question beforehand. Is there something off with Vedar that our expenses are showing up as negatives, which are showing every percent used? That happened, I know. Vedar is the accounting software system. Yeah. I just, I just am noticing that. That's yeah. been like that since we switched over to the web-based version. Well, look at me it's, paying attention. It's the new <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just last week. So. Oh, okay, just happened last week, thank you. Um, it's, it's the new and improved, and yeah, we have, issues like that. I mean, it's if it's listed as an expense, I don't see why you really need a negative. We know an expense is obviously a negative. And then, yeah, the percent used, it says negative. Um, I suppose, since this is an access report um, that we kind of just feed in raw mm -hmm. Excel data into it, it, it chews it up and, and uh, sends out this report, I might be able to build in a formula just multiplying by negative one or something mm -hmm. to bring it back to a positive. But yeah, that's it's straight out of Vader like that, yeah. so uh, you can see what I can do with it. Um, any questions on the local budget? Then we can move on to the revolving accounts. It's like an echo in here. Yeah. Lunch. Lunch. I'll get in next. So. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, again, some of these have, uh, I guess, outstanding, we should say, I almost need an asterisk next to them. Um, the lunch account is certainly one of them. You can see, I was so excited with the $119 uh, balance we had in August, but as you can see, that's gone down significantly. Um, there have been no revenues posted whatsoever in those accounts for August or September. So none of the cash that was taken in at the registers, None of the online payments, certainly none of the reimbursements um, that we normally receive. So that's a good portion of it right there. Um, that you know that, that's not done here. It's done at the on the town side. So once that gets posted, you'll see it kind of come back around. Now I can't really promise or even hint that it would be back into the positive because I don't think we have that many revenues coming, but. Nevertheless, um, it is something that, you know, it, it, it's not as bad as it looks. Uh, the preschool account, that's kind of a similar situation in that we've paid salaries from that that will be transferred over to the 391 grant, which is our, our preschool grant. We had not had approval for that, and now we do, so we can transfer uh, quite a bit of salary actually over to that thing. So that'll boost that one up as well. Student activity really not a heck of a lot of change um, since the end of June, uh, and the school choice you can see we haven't used it uh, you know at all this year yet, so it's just been increasing. Um, and, and that's basically about it for the revolving accounts. Um, then we had a couple more items: the capital um, plan. So we had two items on the warrant at the special town meeting last Thursday. One of them was the security um, upgrades that we want to implement here at both schools. Um, that was passed. It's for, I believe, $98,000. And uh, so, you know, we, we have a whole list of items which you've seen the recommendations from uh, the Hadley Police on what we should do. Um, I spoke with Mike Duffy and Jeff on Friday morning 
and they are now gathering pricing. Um, a lot of these items, we need three prices before we can move forward on them, so we will get the pricing uh, for that. Uh, then this morning, Ann told me that there is a grant out, or it will be coming out for security upgrades for schools. So we're going to just kind of hold off on that to see what the grant is like. Is it a matching grant? And we just don't know. Um, but we really hate to spend the town's money until we know if we might actually be able to spend less of it if we just kind of hold off on the grant. So uh, we're kind of just in a wait and see. But in the meantime, we can get all this behind the scenes work done of gathering pricing and, uh, and being ready to just move as soon as we hear from them. Um, we also had the kitchen upgrades for Hopkins, which were the cooler and freezer, uh, the serving line, and then we had some hood repairs, one of which was already done. So that's, that was a lunch account expense. It was around $860, I believe, that we, we had some emergency work done on that. That would be transferred over to that money when we receive it. Uh, but that, account, that line uh, was a borrowing line, so it actually has to go to a vote. I'm not sure when that vote's going to occur at this point. So it's been delayed. It's not necessarily a bad thing because, quite honestly, you really don't want to take the cooler and freezer out of the kitchen. You can't do it during the school year. You might be able to pull it off over Christmas vacation, but you might not. I just don't know how long they would actually have to be apart. So it might be one of those items that we wait until the summer to do anyway. So. You know, that's, that's certainly okay as far as that goes. Um, and that's, that's basically where we stand on the capital items. I don't know if you guys have any questions on those. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I wasn't sure if both of them had to go back in front of the town, but just the one. Just, just the one, percent. yeah, yeah. Um, we also have some, some HES water news. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw a lot of numbers at you, so. Not lead. Nothing to do with No, no, it's quality. nothing to do with But if you, can, if you can recall, I said how they were using about four times the water of, of Hopkins. Yeah. So I reached out to the water department um, a couple of weeks ago or so, and I just asked them, can you please give us our, our usage history, because this is just crazy, the amount of water we're using there. And they said that it, it spiked last fall um, for whatever reason. And they sent me all the numbers. So it's from May of 17 to August of 17, we used about 17,000 cubic feet. I don't know what cubic foot is in regards to a gallon of water, but that's how much we used there. And then all of a sudden from August to November, it went up to 49,000 plus. So it, it tripled for no apparent reason. The, the funky thing about that is, if you think from May to August, I mean, there's all of July and depending when in August, there's nobody there really. I mean, there's some staff, but not a lot of people. And then all of a sudden, when all the students come back, it used a bunch more. And you'd say, okay, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Except that it continued. It, it went up again to 66,000 from November to February. And you'd say, well, wow, I mean, in those, you've got, the, you've got the Christmas break, you've got the February vacation, you know, there's a number of holidays in there. And, and now, you know, again, we added, now we're up to four times as much water as we used a few months back. Then in 18, February to May of 18, it went up to 70, almost 76,000 cubic feet. So it's, it's just going up, up, up every quarter. The last one they did, May to August, was 77,200. And, and it's like, well, okay, May to August, again. I understand last summer we used 16.9, and a year later we used 77.2. That's a huge jump. And, and again, this is the summer. There's nobody there. You know, we so had- breaking the line. What's that? Like breaking the line. They're, they checked for leaks. There were no leaks. Um, so we, we don't really know, you know, it, it made no sense to us. You know, Jeff mentioned that they had workers there, but we had 10 workers. Let's be honest. I mean, 10 they're workers aren't going to use as many as much water as 300 on, kids. Are we, are we relying on that data? So, well, then they said so far this year, or this quarter, from August 18th to a couple of weeks ago, we used 4,680 feet, which means it, it has gone down significantly. And I said, all right, this makes no sense, because now that the students are back, we're using less water than we did when nobody was there. Uh, so they changed the water meter, um, and they installed, uh, it's, it's a compound meter, they said. Basically, it's like a smart meter, and it can give us the history per day, it can give us the history per hour of usage, so we can see what exactly is going on with it, um, because th this just makes no sense other than the fact that um, 
you know, the water usage <laughs> jumps up and down at, at random, apparently. Have we been paying, we, I'm assuming we're paying for the use. Well, you know, that's, that's the use. tricky part here, is, you know, we've paid for this water. I'm interested to see what this new meter does, because, first of all, I can't understand how the usage went down so far in this current um, period. But I'm very interested to see now with the new meter if it stays this low, which would really make more sense, quite honestly. Um, we shouldn't be using any more now than we did a couple of years ago, and roughly the same number of kids. You know, there's really nothing different except that because this usage was going up, we really went around and looked at every faucet in the building, and there were a couple with drips that we prepared. So, um, you know, we, we looked wherever we could. There's really not much to say about this. You're other talking than about a four and a half fold increase. Really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. I went from 16.9 to 77.2. I mean, that's wow. that's almost five times as much. Is there any outside water usage, like um, watering fields or water? No. Fields? They asked about that. Did you put a new lawn in? No, yeah. we haven't. Um, I I just have no idea. You know what it could be. So, my thought is that it it could very well be the meter. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's the only thing that actually makes sense here, um, but we'll know they installed it over this past weekend. Oh, that's good. So we'll be able to see very quickly, uh, you know, what the usage is, and uh, I guess we can go from there. That's if they good. find that the former meter is faulty in some way, can they credit anything? That that's a very good question. I don't know the okay. answer to that. Um, the total budget line item for this year for water and sewer is what we're talking about, right? Thirteen thousand five hundred. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, just cut it roughly in half for say the elementary school and and, and Hopkins, uh, and the first bill that we paid was about five thousand dollars. The next bill we're going to pay, which would be this seventy-seven two, it's going to be about six thousand so dollars. And that's just for one building. So you can see how the budget just got totally blown out of the water here. Yeah. So if we get a couple months of significantly lower, we should contest it. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, they were very good, quite honestly. Um, you know, incredibly informative. As you, you know, they, they sent me all the usage. She was very, very helpful. And you know, they installed this meter on a Saturday at no charge to us. You know, so I, I would anticipate that you know they would be able to work with us at, at some degree. Um, we just have to wait and see really what the usage is now. So, thanks for Hopefully. digging into that. Just tell people nobody <laughs> flushes the toilet. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Anything else, Chris? Um, that's all I believe I have. I, okay. I don't have the agenda up here, but I think that's Thank it. you. Uh, grant report was the only thing. Oh, yeah, and we, because the grants have no expenditures and we still haven't gotten approval for the final two, there's really no okay. report at this point. All right. Move on to the uh, school committee reports and discussion. Policy meeting. And then we're looking at um, mid-November, the 19th or the 20th. We'll get that scheduled. And which, which groups of policies are next on our list, Andy? Do you remember? I don't remember what letters I should, but I don't. I'm sure it will be fun. <laughs> Helps us. <coughs> finance tri board. Uh, you updated on the town meeting. I have no other finance or tri board updates for tonight. Okay. Capital and fields. Paul. Oh. So Chris covered the capital and <coughs> the fields. I think we might. <coughs> excuse me. Have an announcement soon. It's not ready yet. Okay. Anything else on that? No. All right. Collaborative. Camera. Uh, just three days after the last school committee meeting, I attended the most recent CPS board meeting, and uh, I sent you uh, the executive director's report uh, to your email, as well as, this time around, a catalog of the 40-some-odd professional development learning opportunities that CES is providing, and there are some great opportunities for learning here. Um, for our educators potentially, or even to um, borrow some of these instructional um, people for our own PD. Um, some great uh, improving outcomes for student living in poverty and trauma, all the way to uh, growth mindset for math students, increasing perseverance and engagement and, and everything in between. Uh, so uh, check that out. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, the last item we had was the PVCI, 
That's an expansion request. Um, <clears throat> as you all may recall, and I've given you a copy of the letter that we sent previously when uh, PDCICS had uh, requested an expansion and it was um, going forward and, and to the, um, the board at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for approval, we did uh, join with some other neighboring districts in submitting letters, uh, essentially outlining our concerns around that plan. And uh, we have been approached by uh, Amherst School Committee as well as Northampton School Committee asking us what our stance is on this most recent uh, submission for an expansion request. Um, Annie has pulled together some comparative data to show really the two concerns that we had raised in our prior letter, um, which is dated March 2018. It was, uh, and just for some framing, we originally sent this letter in December of 2017. We revisited it in March when the next expansion uh, request came forward and we agreed at that school committee meeting to just resend our last, our prior letter because the concerns had not yet been addressed. And primarily uh, what we listed out was while we support the charter school and obviously we, you know, we have many families in the area that um, send some or all of their children to that school. Um, and we respect the wishes of families to, to send their children to, to Piney Valley Chinese Immersion and Charter School for their education that the, the concerns we had were, number one, the enrollment request that they have to expand their enrollment um, doesn't seem to be uh, justified given the numbers, the current enrollments that they had uh, and what they had uh, stated were their um, the waiting list, so to add to current enrollment. So that was number one. Um, and number two, we had questions around whether or not current enrollment is reflective of broader student population. So. Um, given students with needs uh, seemed underrepresented in the data that we were looking at as compared to other um, uh, comparative information that is presented. Setting aside the concerns that we've raised for a number of years about the funding formula and the impact that charter schools have on our district, that's, that's not a, you know, issue that we're necessarily bringing to bear here because that's not what is being um, approved. What's being approved, is, what's being considered is an, a, a request for an expansion. And so really trying to respond directly to that, uh, the question that I wanted to bring forward to you is um, given this latest request, given uh, the data that's been presented by Annie, whether or not we want to revisit our position or if our prior position from earlier in the year stands and if we'd like to do issue any kind of uh, written communication to the state as a, as a school committee um, in regards to this issue. So there's a couple things on the table here in terms of do we think that our position has changed in any way? which you know, it may have and we should talk about that. And if it hasn't, then I think um, then the next question is, how can we publicly um, indicate our position? My personal position hasn't changed. I would, would advocate for another letter um, that was similar. I agree, I agree. But Annie, where did these data come from? So that I provided with you, that you have in the packet? Anybody in the public can go to, on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website, if you look up charter schools, and if you look up uh, tuition, finance, and enrollments, you can get access to a tool called CHART. It's a charter school analytic review tool. And so CHART is what gives you all the information around enrollment, attrition, gap narrowing targets, all that's publicly available. <coughs> CHART. Desi. And the comparison index is what? The comparison index is not comparison index to this school, but to all schools from which the charter draws students. So that's the CI is every one of their it's potential sending schools. It's relevant to the charter school. What's that? It, it's relevant to the charter school. Correct. Can you scroll up? The, there's the, also the factor, no, I'm sorry, the other one. The, um, that 
Reinsurer reimbursement. Yes. So if you same place if uh, on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education webpage under Charter Schools and again finance, tuition, and enrollments, and there's one of the workbooks there shows for each town, and you can look up by the charter school. You can look up. Uh, in this case, you look up by your sending school district or sending LEA, and so it lists right there for you. The department puts out there the amount owed through Chapter 46 Charter Reimbursement and uh, the actual charter reimbursement received by that town. And what's interesting is that in the Governor's Supplemental Budget, which we are extremely grateful because that's where the grant for public safety will come in, but included in the Supplemental Budget because the, the state had a tremendous surplus last year, which is great, in FY18, was reimbursement for regional transportation, fully funding Circuit Breaker, and fully funding Chapter 46. All three of those things were cut in the supplemental budget. Cut by the legislature, the governor, which one did you say it was in? So it was the governor's supplemental budget, but I don't know who cut it. So he proposed Sorry. it. But yeah, so, it was so I don't know where it got cut. Okay. I don't want to speak so out. So is it yet. fair to say that if the charter school were to expand, this discrepancy between actual and owed would change? Or is that unclear? I think that's unclear because actual and owed depends on the, the formula quite simply is over six years. It's the difference in cost in year one under chapter 46, the town should get 100% of the increase. And for each year thereafter, they should get 25% of the increase. Um, so it depends on what that fluctuation is. Um, yeah. And that starts with the beginning of the charter that wouldn't necessarily change with the amendment to the charter? No, no, that's part, Chapter 46 is separate from amendments. I'm just wondering, there seems to be an economic argument. I get your point, uh, Heather, that they're separate somewhat, but that is a motivating factor that we've never been fully reimbursed by what the state had promised associated with the charter school, to a significant amount. Mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. a lot of money there that's not being reimbursed through our, our school, our town. Right, which I think would, you know, obviously potentially be amplified if there were even more spots open and we had more students uh, lost to well, that's that what opportunity. I was wondering, uh, and I think all, all we really said about that is that as a small district, we're, you know, even, it's a greater impact for us because we have, you know, we're starting with a small student population as it is as compared to some of our neighboring larger districts. And is this a cumulative amount? Is this a cumulative? These are annual amounts. amounts. I didn't add it up. This right, is but if you added up, it would be cumulative, and that's a fair. So, would it be fair to say to the town, we're owed well over you know, a million dollars? I also, it's important to know in Hadley that this is, cash. when you're talking about the economic piece, it is a larger, just like the comparison index, this is, it affects many districts. Um, in Hadley, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and you will get an updated and revised thorough report, everything you didn't want to know about the charter school funding formula, just for your bedside reading in a future <laughs> packet. But you'll understand more of it than you want to. Uh, but now Hadley's actually listed on what's recommended skip over. So the law also states that no school district, no town, or no school district, shall pay more than 9% of their actual net school spending to total charter tuition payments. And um, we are, as of last year, at 8%. So if you are, if you're in the bottom 10% performing throughout the Commonwealth, you can be required to spend up to 18% of your actual net school spending on charter tuitions. We are not in that boat, hence the reason we care about accountability. We are, uh, but the 9% cap applies. At 9%, Charter schools must skip over applicants from that community. We are at 8%, so DESE has us on a list of saying, we recommend that applicants from Hadley that you skip over, but we know that the charters are not skipping over, even though DESE has that on their webpage. You can also find that on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's webpage, um, the recommended so schools. that's not enforced? It's recommended. But it's enforced after nine. It's enforced after nine. It is. The, I thought PDPA stopped taking kids from certain towns, and I wasn't sure why. So it could be that they're adhering to the actual enforcement. I would have to look. If we look this year, 
if any Hadley students were accepted into charter schools, then we know for a fact that they're not, that charter school is not adhering to the recommended skip over from DESE. And beyond the, the economic argument, which is very impactful, um, if you look at their, at, the, at, the, at their percentage of enrollment for ELLs, just, uh, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, um, they have stayed the same. And if they're saying that they are this tool, this, this engine for integration, um, and it would, it would make, if they're going to claim that, then they should be showing that they're actively recruiting students, and they're not. So, yeah, my position hasn't changed. Mine hasn't either. I'm just curious the other districts that reached out to you mm -hmm. and asked what our stance was. Can we make an assumption that their stances haven't changed and they're looking for us to actively show our support Correct. again? Yes, and um, I did direct them to our prior public communication so that they knew. I think that there has just been some confusion from earlier um, support from the town for supporting the school, obviously, uh, and a prior expansion of the school. And now here we are with this most current uh, iterative process and we've I think remained steady in opposing it for really the reasons cited in our letter so I brought that up uh, with both representatives from Amherst and North Hampton. I think also at the time when we found out that the town which town is very pro-development mm -hmm. right That's new right. building means new revenue for the town um, but we also um, said that we we needed them to understand how this could hurt them on the other side, potentially, on the financial side, um, in terms of the town needing to carry more of the expenses of our schools. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure that we did close that loop and make that statement to our town officials, because what we don't want is a week from now, and two weeks from now, to have a press release from the town of Hadley government <laughs> stating their support for the charter expansion if, if, at, while we're also writing this letter opposed to it. And um, we can make sure that they're aware that we're reissuing the letter. Um, when the application from um, PPC ICS went in last fall, it included the select board letter from 2013, I think it was. I'm, I'm, don't quote me on that. I'm going to say it, it was predated. Yeah, but it included that support letter in terms of um, supporting the the building and the growth within the town. But they cited this, so I think that that has, um, unfortunately, incorrectly made other school committee towns think that we are in alignment with that position of support for future expansion. So just because the letter was from 2013, they're still seeing it as a current um, level of support. So one way to counteract that might be to ask the select board to Letter that goes in with ours, so that might just prevent the previous PA from using the old letter. Mm -hmm. Or at least you can ask them to consider consider it. I don't know what their position is on an expansion from the economic standpoint. Have they ever been briefed on the economic impacts of the charter schools that have a proposed expansion? Yes. They have. <laughs> yes, yeah. they have. Um, it is, in, in fairness to folks, it is. Quite a bit complicated. It really is, and so they do have a copy of my riveting treatise on charter schools, <laughs> which is so sad that people don't have it memorized. And and now we do talk about it quite often every year budget in the budget presentation. I did because it was correcting a factual error. So technically, the school department has submitted one part of public comment which is in their application to expand. I believe I copied you all into that. There was something that was incorrectly stated indicating that the superintendent had met with the leadership of PBCICS and had discussed leasing and purchase opportunities in the town. I don't have the authority to do that. I don't own any property here, so I have, that had not happened, and I did clarify that. So I'm just wondering, too, if we resubmit this letter, if we add this as an agenda, this is good homework. The, the data tables. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, it you is. reference the economic. Uh, yeah, I think we should uh, cite the source. Yeah, and then yeah, if we could include that as an addendum and um, have it highlight our concerns. Right. 
Um, and then maybe to the point of circling back with the select board um, at a future meeting, just making sure that they're aware of our communication and we could also include whether or not they would like to see the amendment then for consideration. How quickly do we need to take this into consideration? Can we do this? No, we can't wait till the next meeting, unfortunately. This one was December. Yeah, I don't have, I can. No, no, I mean to the next select board meeting. Oh. Do we have time to wait till the next select board meeting? Is this something we need to have faster? Well, I think um, for tonight, if we agree that we want to move forward with a letter, yep. what we can do is, if we what we want to do is involve the select board in their consideration of potentially having a companion or, you know, additional communication then we can act on that. But I think meanwhile, we can work on drafting our letter with the addendum of the cited data, supply that to the select board, and then um, give them the instruction on how they can also issue a letter should they choose to do so. I don't want to speak for them in terms of how they may shape house um, in terms of an action, but should they choose to, to take the similar stance that we do, then we can at least be giving them um, the information that was helpful for us. So I think if that's something that we want to act on tonight, um, I can help move that forward in terms of getting an updated draft, which I don't think much has to change other than supporting it with the data that we, that we pulled together. Do you agree? And then I can also reach out to um, the select board in terms of them moving them in and seeing if they'd like to take some more uh, consideration. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was December, um, Annie. Yeah, I think you're right. Yes, I do think we need a motion just to make sure that this, uh, it's on the record what we're approving moving forward to do and issue. So motion to uh, write a letter from the school committee to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education about um, our our lack of support, our non-support, for the expansion of the Pioneer Valley uh, Chinese Living School. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. All right. Let's go look on that. Um, what else? We have warrants. Minutes. Okay. In minutes. So let's see. Approval of AP warrants. Accounts payable warrants submitted in September. Is there a motion? Motion to approve the warrants in September. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain? Approval of minutes from September 27th uh, meeting. Move to approve the minutes of the September 27th meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Approval of warrants submitted uh, in September 2018. Is there a motion? Is this a payroll? Motion to approve the warrants in September 2018. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we did hard Who was the second on that? I'm sorry. Just me. All right. Wait a second. <laughs> Get the gold star. That's right. We did all the other approvals. Um, our next regular meeting date is November 26, 2018. I would like to ask if um, we could consider another date for folks. I'm out, but if you want to meet in my absence, that's fine. Uh, if you're available the week before, November 19th, are people available? Either the 19th or the 20th. I can do the 19th. I can do the 19th. 19th will be better. 19th. 19th of October. Oh, no, November. November, yeah. Okay, that works. Okay, that would okay, be great. Thank you. Um, so we'll do the 19th, and we have three topics, so PBIS tab, school discipline data, early warning indicator system data, and report on student activities. And there's a final thing, what information would you like? Uh, Massachusetts state minimum wage will go up January 1st, 2019 to $12 an hour. We have um, a couple substitute cafeteria hourly wage right now set at 11. We have step run summer custodian set at 11. You could just say, we'll just let them go up to the new minimum. I would recommend that the school committee, since you do this for all union personnel, that um, you do some sort of 
regional analysis of those wages for food service workers and our custodial faculty that are in a union, but should certainly be given the same sure. uh, respect. What data, if you'd like to do that, what data would you like me uh, to provide to you in order for you to be able to do that? Probably similar pay, pay rates from the same yeah. districts that you would be okay. looking so at. So Hampshire for County districts. Mm -hmm. for, because we also want to remain competitive, right? We don't want to have a problem that we can't get anybody to work for us because we right. pay far lower than other. We'll get those together. All right, thank okay. you. Great. Uh, motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second. All right. All right. All right. Probably didn't thank have to you. do that, but. <laughs> no. but Paul is a great second. I had just the data shows. He's a committed second.